Hello, history friends, and welcome back to the Cabinet of Curiosity, where the star of this week's show is... This! Plain wooden box. Yep. But not just any box. What if I told you that this unassuming wooden container holds the secret cure to all human ailments, including the power to raise the very dead from their graves? <laughs> but more on that later. First, let's talk about electric shocks and fish. The fascination with shocking people back to health with electricity goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, and probably long before that. This is because the Mediterranean Sea and surrounding rivers are home to several species of electric fish. People were particularly fascinated with this blobby little friend, the torpedo fish, or electric ray. The torpedo fish has a chemical battery in its head, which can produce between 8 and 220 volts of electricity, depending on the species. It also hangs out invisibly on the ocean floor waiting for victims, or for an unlucky human to step on it by accident and get the worst case of pins and needles ever. A word on naval warfare. In case you were wondering, and I know you were, you observant little monkeys, the word torpedo comes from the Latin torpere, which means to numb or paralyze, and was applied to the fish first. The naval weapon called a torpedo was originally a form of tethered or floating underwater mine. These mines would lurk below the surface and give ships a big shock if they disturbed them, hence the name. Anyways, after hundreds of years of numb legs and some thinking, people presumably realized that you could apply this torpedo fish effect to things you didn't want to feel, and a proud medical tradition was born. The ancient Greeks and Romans put live torpedo fish on people to numb them during operations in childbirth and to treat headaches, arthritis, and depression. A prescription for gout from approximately 30 AD tells the patient to stand with one foot on the wet sand and the other upon a live and presumably very annoyed, black torpedo fish until the entire foot and leg are numb. And that, as far as electrotherapy goes, was pretty much it for the next 1,670 years, give or take a decade. But then came the Age of Enlightenment, or the age of men in wigs and tights doing dangerous things to themselves and others for science. And one of the dangerous things that they loved was trying to capture and move electricity specifically static electricity, the kind produced by thunderstorms and fuzzy slippers. People knew for thousands of years that if you rubbed a piece of amber with something fuzzy, it would start mysteriously sticking to stuff. The Greek word for amber is actually electron, from where we get electricity. 18th century scientists observed this effect and wondered what would happen if you did exactly the same thing, only, like, more. Usually, this involved a glass tube or globe that rotated against a source of friction, like a piece of woolen cloth or dry paper, or just a human hand, similar to what happens if you rub your head with a party balloon. The static electricity generated by the friction could then be conducted away and contained in a primitive capacitor, also known as a jar full of water. The electricity could then be used, as in this case, to shock the bejeepers out of somebody's kneecap, which brings us to our next point. As soon as people had easy access to large amounts of electricity, they started wondering, what could it do for your health? Surely if it could fling you across the room and make your hair stand on end, it could do something about that pesky tuberculosis. Scientists began running electric current through people in the hopes of making them better. I'm not going to mention all the scientists here because the list is just too dang long. But the greatest hits include Johann Gottlob Kruger and his student Christian Kratzenstein, who were among the first to suggest that you could use electricity for medicine, specifically to cure palsied limbs, and are considered the grandpappies of electrotherapy. Jan Ingenhaus, a Dutch scientist who in 1783 accidentally invented cranial shock therapy when he hit himself in the head with a homemade bolt of lightning and found that he was in a strangely good mood the next morning. And of course, Mr. Kite in a thunderstorm himself, physicist and statesman Benjamin Franklin. Franklin experimented with spark and shock treatments, but eventually concluded that most of his patients benefited more from the brisk walk to his laboratory than from the electricity. And let's not forget the quacks. There were dozens of those too, but the most spectacular was a Scot named James Graham, peddler of nostrums, sex therapist, vegetarian, nudist, early proponent of grounding, philosopher, and lover of all things electrified. Here he is in a typically subtle and nuanced 18th century cartoon, threatening another quack of the era with a strategically placed electrical machine. 
Graham also invented a magnetic electrified bed. Designed as the perfect environment to encourage conception, the bed was an impressive 12 by 9 feet, supported and insulated by a base of 40 multicolored cut glass pillars. It was also covered with a massive domed canopy, equipped with clockwork musical automatons, live doves, and a series of pipes which wafted pleasant smells and ethereal sounds toward whoever was on it. On top of this, it also vibrated and had a reclining frame, which to me sounds less like a romantic evening and more like trying to get pregnant on a tilt-a-whirl. Oh, I feel so sensual and relaxed right now! Who wants to make a baby?! But hey, whatever vibrates your 18th century musical sex robots, as they say. Through the 18th to the middle of the 19th century, electrotherapy advanced by leaps and bounds, simultaneously researched and prescribed by real physicians and marketed to the public as a cure-all and home remedy. Technology and manufacturing improved to the point that instead of having a room-sized friction device, you could produce electric charge with something as small as a shoebox. The proliferation of the mail-order catalog, the Amazon of its day, meant that anybody could order cheaply made electrotherapy devices and have them delivered to their home. And did they? There were electric combs and brushes to cure baldness and headaches, electric insoles for gout and rheumatism, electric corsets to zap your waist smaller, I guess, and of course electrical belts for illnesses of the, um, male vigor. And if you didn't want to be that specific, you could just get a general medical battery, consisting of a few wires and a dry cell battery in a wooden box. But wait, did somebody say... Wooden box? This is the Apollo Medical Apparatus. It's what's called a family battery and was designed specifically for amateur home use. In its heyday, a box like this would have had several electrodes, which we sadly don't have anymore, but they came in all different shapes and sizes. Massage rollers, sponges, wristbands, all the way up to nasal, rectal, and urethral attachments, all designed to transmit the electricity from the box to your flesh as quickly and pleasantly as possible. It's all written out in this convenient pamphlet, the Electrotherapeutic Handbook, written by Mr. Edward Travert between approximately 1890 and 1910-ish. Like every other medical battery, the Apollo claims to cure an impressive list of ailments, including acne, hiccups, narcolepsy, weak ankles, obesity, and falling of the anus. But all of these cures involve putting a positive electrode on one bit of you and a negative electrode on another bit of you, and then kind of rubbing them around until you maybe feel better, sort of. The treatments also have some non-electricity-based aspects. For example, for obesity, the treatment is to apply a strong secondary current through the abdomen, but also to avoid all starchy or fatty foods, take long walks of 5 to 10 miles per day, and use no alcoholic liquors. Which sounds a lot like a diet. But what do I know? I'm not a Victorian doctor. But that's not all. The Apollo medical apparatus can also treat the big stuff. The cancer. The diabetes. The tumors. The TB. And of course, the most pernicious and difficult to treat ailment of all. The death. Well, technically it's just apparent death. But still. So, how does the home electrotherapist outwit the cold hand of the seemingly grim reaper? Simple! Place the positive electrode at the back of the neck and apply the negative to the body over the lungs and heart. A mild secondary current is first used, gradually increasing it until the patient shows signs of life. Keep this treatment up for about five minutes. Also apply the negative electrode to the arms, wrists, and hands. Now sponge the whole body with the negative while the positive electrode is at the base of the spine. Plenty of fresh air should be let into the room and the patient's feet and hands should be kept warm with hot water bags. So if you're like me, and your only medical expertise are faint memories of Red Cross CPR courses and TV medical dramas floating around in the dusty chambers of your skull, you may be wondering, wait, isn't that how a defibrillator works? Did they have defibrillators in 1904? And the short answer is, no. The long answer is, no. While well, people started experimenting with shocking hearts back to life directly back in the 1920s, the first external defibrillator wasn't invented until the 1950s, and it weighed 120 kilos. The first portable defibrillator wasn't invented until the 1960s, and it weighed 70 kilos and was powered by car batteries. So did the Apollo medical apparatus actually help with anything?
Not really. It's true that today electrical stimulation is used to treat chronic pain and depression and muscle spasm, things that involve electrical impulses in the nerves and the tissues in the brain. But unfortunately for obesity, acne, hiccups, and death, there's no evidence that it cured any of those. Or anything else, really. Except of course for a CPD or chronic placebo deficiency. The popularity of medical batteries began to decline in the teens and 20s, as they were replaced by other devices which plugged into the wall rather than requiring their own battery. It didn't help that in the 1910s various regulatory agencies began campaigns to shut down or limit the manufacture of quack medical devices. And then there was competition. By the 1920s electricity was old news, and people were looking to a new source for their miracle cures, radiation. Defibrillator, the, the first external defibrillator, 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 defibrill